If you will, take your Bibles and open with me to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 5 as we start this morning, verse number 12, down through the end of the chapter. Hebrews 5 and verse 12. We're studying a series of lessons called A Closer Walk with Thee. We've been learning how to walk closer to Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. We studied earlier in the year from the 23rd Psalm. But he's only going to be our shepherd if we follow him. And to follow him means to walk close to him and as close as possible. We've talked about being disciples of Jesus and how that means to be a learner. So we learn the teaching of Christ. But it also means to be a follower of Jesus and even to the point of being an imitator. To learn to think as he thinks and to live as he lived. That's our goal always as Christians. And one of the things that is key to walking close to the Lord is being able to discern between good and evil. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so we as Christians have a responsibility to be able to discern what is good and what is evil. And the way we gain that ability is by exercising our senses. And that starts with studying God's Word, as we talked about in our last couple of lessons, that we study what the Bible teaches, and then, of course, we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ by not only reading what the Bible says, but actually doing what the Bible says. And by doing those things, our senses become exercised. It's spiritual exercise. We grow our spiritual muscles. And the more we know what the Bible teaches, the more clearly we can see what is right and what is wrong. And the more we put into practice what the Bible says, the more we, again, see good in contrast with evil in our own lives and also in the world around about us. Jesus lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He knew right from wrong, and he always chose to do what was right. And our goal is to be like him. Now, we're not perfect, and we all make mistakes, and we all sin, but we strive to live like Jesus did. And in order to do that, to be able to choose right and not to choose wrong, we have to understand the difference between the two. So this morning, we're going to ask some questions about choices that we might face about things we have to make decisions about and and determine whether it is a good thing or an evil thing, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. And so knowing the difference between good and evil is key to our lives as Christians and walking close to the Lord. So the first thing we want to ask is when it comes to making a decision, choosing whether to do something or not, the first question is, is this thing condemned by God? Is it something that God tells us in his word is wrong? So we're going to turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 3 to uh, start thinking about this idea and understand that if God condemns something in scripture, then that makes it wrong, makes it evil and something that we're not to do. Now as we say that, we have to understand that we today live under the New Testament We don't live under the Old Testament system. That law was nailed to the cross. Jesus fulfilled it. And by doing so, he was able to institute his new covenant, which is the New Testament. So under the Old Testament, for example, God commanded Noah to build an ark. And if I don't build an ark today, that doesn't mean that I've done wrong because that command wasn't for me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That was a command for the children of Israel under the Old Testament. That's not a command for me today as a Christian. So we have to keep things in their proper perspective. We live by the teaching of the New Testament, not by the Old Testament. That doesn't mean we don't study it and learn from it. Obviously we do. But our law today is the gospel, the New Testament of Christ. And so we're going to follow that standard and that teaching. 
So when we read a passage like Ephesians 5, uh, beginning in verse number 3, Paul writes these words. He says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. So when God gives us a list of things such as this, he's telling us that these things are evil, they're wrong, and they're sinful. In fact, the words that he uses here, he tells us that those who do these things are children of disobedience, not obeying God, but disobeying God. He says that those who do these things do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You can't be a faithful child of God and practice these things. You can't go to heaven and practice these things. And so when we read a list like this, we understand that God is condemning certain things. And that means there's no room for argument. God says fornication is a sin, and that makes it a sin. Whether I like it or not, whether the world agrees with that or not, God says it, and that settles it. And so our standard for right and wrong doesn't come from the world. If we look at the world round about us, most of the things listed in this passage, the world would say, well, well, that's okay. Or at least we can find some reason to excuse these things in our lives. But when God condemns something, that means it's condemned. And so for, fornication is wrong no matter how you look at it. Covetousness is wrong. And all the things that he lists here. And this is not the only list of things like this in the scripture. You can read the end of Romans chapter 1, and there's a, a long list, many verses of things that God says are condemned. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 lists things that if you do these things, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read starting in verse number 19 to notice also uh, another list here, but it leads us into our next point as well. But We have a list of the works of the flesh along with the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 beginning in verse 19. Paul says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, there's a list. And by the way, when God gives us a list like this... And sometimes it's words that are big words or words that we don't use very often or we may not understand. If God is telling me this is wrong and if you do this, you can't be a part of my kingdom and you can't go to heaven, that ought to register with me enough to go get a dictionary and look up what this word means. If God says if you do this, you can't go to heaven, I want to make sure I'm not doing that. And sometimes we read these passages and we read these words and we say, well, I don't really know what that means, so I I don't have to answer for that. But that's not true. We say, well, I don't understand what it means, but it must not be that important. It's absolutely important. And so we need to look closely at what God says and take initiative ourselves to make sure that we're not guilty of things that God has condemned. And so the point here is that if God says it, that settles it. And if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And I can argue with it, you know, all day long. But when I stand before him in judgment and I have done these things and he says, but my word said not to do those things, then I don't don't have anything to stand on. I'm guilty and I'm going to be condemned and lost because of it. And so the first way to discern between good and evil is to ask, does God condemn this? And if he does then it's wrong. So don't choose to do that. Choose to do something different and to do what is right. Now, going along with that, as we read here in Galatians 5, the second question we need to ask, is this thing that I'm deciding whether or not to do, is it similar to the things that God has condemned? 
If you notice at the end of verse uh, 21, well, not at the end, but in the middle, it's at the end of the list, Paul uses a phrase where he says, and such like. So he gives us a list of specific things that are wrong and that are condemned, and then he says, and such like, which means I may not have mentioned it specifically in this list, but if it's like these things, then it's wrong, just like these things are wrong. And so we have to be able to reason clearly and correctly to determine if something is like what we are, uh, what God has condemned in Scripture. So there are things that the Bible doesn't mention specifically that, that are wrong. For example, uh, the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not smoke marijuana, right? The Bible doesn't teach that at all. And um, that's kind of a big thing in our world today. And I hear this argument all the time that, well, it's a plant, right? And God created plants, and so if God created this plant, he meant for us to use it, and therefore there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. Do you know the Bible condemns drunkenness? In fact, here in this passage in, in Galatians 5, drunkenness is mentioned specifically. And you know where beer comes from, right? It comes from a plant. Grapes were used to make wine, right? That becomes alcoholic. That's a plant. God made those, but he didn't make them for us to abuse them in a way that causes us not to think soberly. Everybody knows heroin comes from the poppy, right? Those beautiful flowers, you put poppy seeds on your muffin, they taste great. But they, you can make that stuff into, into heroin. That doesn't mean God wants us all to, to, to do heroin, right? The same is true with marijuana, it has a function, right? God made it, obviously, but that doesn't mean he made it for us to use in a way that clouds our judgment. God commands us to be sober, sober-minded in all that we do. And so that would include not being drunken with wine or with strong drink, other alcoholic beverages, but also anything else that clouds our mind, which would include marijuana, but it would also include any number of things, even things that you can go to your doctor and get a prescription for. Just because the doctor says it's okay for you to take this and you take it and you're out of your head and you don't know what you're thinking doesn't mean that that's okay with God. I understand there are sicknesses and certain you know, treatments and whatever and it's temporary, but we have to be careful not to violate God's word with, with any of those things. But that's the idea of and such like. God doesn't have to say, don't drink this alcoholic drink and that one and that one. He doesn't have to give us a list of everything. He just says, don't be drunken, be sober-minded, and that covers the whole spectrum. And so we can apply that in, in any number of ways. The Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not gamble, but the Bible teaches by principle that gambling is a sin because gambling is taking from others in a way that is not honest, in a way that's not dealing fairly with our neighbors. The only way to win at gambling is for everybody else to lose. And so what gambling is, is legalized stealing. I'm stealing your money, it's just that you've said, you know, I'm gonna put my money in and it's okay for you to take it. Just because you say that doesn't make it right. But that, those are principles that we have to remember. Another thing to consider in connection with this is verses 22 and 23. The contrast with the works of the flesh are the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So when it comes to something that we're, we're trying to decide, should I do this or not, is it right or is it wrong, it's often a good exercise to ask, if I had to categorize this thing, would it better fit under the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? And if we're honest with ourselves about this action, you know, we're not just letting our desire for it or our lust for it cloud our thinking, then we can usually rightly determine if this would be a fruit of the Spirit or a work of the flesh. Is this something that is going to, to bring joy or demonstrate love or goodness or, or faith? You know, temperance is an important word, self-control, right? Is this action demonstrating that I'm in control of my life or is it that I'm letting things control my life? And so the such like is 
you know, that God doesn't have to specify every little thing. He teaches in principles, and we have to learn to apply those principles uh, in our lives. And so we have to be willing to question and ask, is this good or is it bad? Is it a work of the flesh or is it the fruit of the Spirit? Is it like those things that are evil or is it like things that are good? And then choose, if it's evil, not to do it. And if it's good, then, of course, to choose to do so. But go with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to notice a passage here with you that asks or, and answers a third question when we're making these kinds of decisions. And the question is, is this thing harmful to my influence? And this is important, and sometimes we, we kind of overlook it or minimize it uh, because we, we have this idea that I just live my life for me, and if, if somebody thinks a certain way about me or whatever, that's their fault and it's not mine. And sometimes that's true, but most of the time we have to remember our influence that we have upon others. And if you look at chapter 9 and verse 19 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, For though I be free from all men, so I have freedom, I don't have to live my life for anyone else, Paul says, even though that's true, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Under the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So notice how Paul is talking about his influence and his influence in the lives of others. He says, in Christ I have freedom, and I don't have to answer to anyone else. But when he was with Jewish people, he tried to understand their way of thinking and their approach to the scriptures and their approach to life, and he tried to appeal to them on their level. He became like them. And that doesn't mean he practiced things that were you know, against the New Testament and, and follow the old law, but it means that he appealed to them on, on, you know, where they were. And the same with those who were not Jews, those who were without law, the Gentiles who weren't under the law of Moses. He understood how they thought and how, you know, they approached life and those things, and he appealed to them from, from where they were. To the weak, those were weak Christians who had beliefs you know, that weren't exactly what, what the Bible teaches, but they believed that it was right. Paul knew that what they believed wasn't right, but he appealed to them, you know, where they were and, and saw where they came from. And the point is that even though he had freedom in Christ, he understood the power of his influence. And so he used it in the right way in order to save souls. <clears throat> he says that by all means, I might save some. If this will help me to bring someone to a knowledge of Jesus and obedience to the gospel, Paul said that I'm willing to do that. Even though I have freedom to live the way you know, that I want to live according to God's word, I'm going to limit myself to these things in order to influence others for good. Now, if you take that idea and come into chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians down at verse 31, notice what he tells us here. He says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God, <clears throat> even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And then he says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And so he says in doing this, he was imitating Jesus and that we are to imitate him as he followed Jesus. And so it comes back to this idea of influence. Paul didn't want to offend, meaning he didn't want to cause to stumble those who were Jews or those who were Gentiles or even those who were Christians. And so he would conduct himself in a way that would be the best possible influence on other people no matter who they were or what their beliefs were or where they were from or whatever, 
He lived his life in such a way to always be a good example and a good influence. And he says that he, he did this to please all men in all things, not for his own profit, but for theirs. And when he says that, it doesn't mean that he's a people pleaser in the sense that he just told people what they wanted to hear. Obviously, Paul didn't do that. He told the truth, and he preached the truth, and sometimes that made people angry or turned them away. And if that were the case, then so be it. But Paul wasn't going to act in such a way that would drive people away, where he was the one driving them away rather than the truth and the gospel driving them away. And so that's the example that he set. And we, of course, are to imitate that and to follow that. If you look over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Peter wrote these words. He says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And what he says there is that someone who would not listen to a preacher preach a sermon or maybe even wouldn't sit down and, and read God's word can still be influenced by the example of a godly person in their life. A husband who has a godly wife can eventually be influenced to be willing to listen to God's word and to obey it and to submit to it because of that influence and that example. So when it comes to choosing what I should do or what I'm going to do, is it right or is it wrong, I need to ask, how is this going to affect my influence? If I do this thing, is it going to cause others to see me as being worldly, as being sinful, as not caring about what God's word teaches and not putting, putting the Bible and, and putting God and, and Christ as a priority in my life? Or is it going to show them that I do those things? And because of that, I might have an influence over them spiritually. Maybe not today, but eventually when there's a time of need in their life or when they're open to the truth, they'll know that I'm a person who stands for what is right and tries to the best of my ability to do what is right. So I have to think about those things when it comes to making those choices, choosing is this good or is this evil. So we talk about things sometimes like forsaking the assembly, you know, and the Bible specifically condemns that in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We're not supposed to be absent when the church comes together to worship. God has settled that. But also it applies when we think about our influence. When I tell someone that I'm a Christian and that means that I love Jesus more than anything else and he's the most important thing in my life, and then the opportunity to come and worship and to sing praises and to hear his word and to serve him, it comes and, and I don't show up. That sets an example to the world that even though I may say he's important to me, by my actions I show that he's really not. And it affects my influence. And so we have to remember those things in determining, determining what is right and what is wrong, discerning between good and evil. Now, there's another consideration to make also. If you want to look at Matthew chapter 25, we won't read this whole passage, but it's the parable of the talents. And the question is, this thing that I'm trying to decide, should I do it or should I not? The question is, is it poor stewardship? And what we mean by stewardship, of course, is that God has placed certain things into our hands, into our lives, into our sphere of influence. And he wants us to use those things to serve him and to honor him and to do good. So in Matthew 25, we have the parable of the talents. Verse 14 says that the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto him them his goods. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. And so we know the story. The man who had five talents gained five more. The man who had two talents gained two more. And the man who had one buried his talent. He hid it in the earth and didn't gain anything with it. And when the Lord comes back, of course, he rewards those who had gained more, who had used their talents to, to acquire more talents, and the one who did not was condemned. And the point is a point about stewardship, that God entrusted this money 
to, to these people, and they were to use it to gain more for him. I say God, of course, in the parable, it's the stew or the, the landowner who put money in their hands. But it's about stewardship. And the principle is that God has put certain things in our hands. One of those things is money. We have material possessions. We have you know, money from our jobs and whatever. God wants us to use that, to be a steward of that, to honor him. And so when I use my money to buy things that are wrong or sinful, that dishonors God. It doesn't honor him. When I use it to do things that are wrong, that doesn't honor God. I need to use that to do good works, to help those who are in need, to, to preach the gospel and, and all of those things that we're to do as Christians. But that's being a good steward. But it's not just money and material possessions. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, we learn also that our bodies are to be used for God's service. That the very you know, physical forms that we have, our hands and our mouths and, and, and our brains and all of those things are gifts from God to be used in his service. Listen to what Paul says. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So again, I'm supposed to use my body to glorify God. And so time comes to assemble and to worship God, and I use my body to do something other than worshiping him, that I'm not being a good steward. The time comes or the opportunity presents itself to talk to somebody about Jesus, about salvation, about the Bible, and I don't use my mouth to do that, then I haven't used my body to honor God. It's about stewardship. Again, God has entrusted this to me to use for his glory. And then, of course, it also has to do with our time. You know, time is limited, and not just time is limited. Resources are limited our bodies are limited, they, they're wearing out, we're headed toward the grave. We only have a certain you know, amount of energy that we can use in God's service. We only have a certain amount of money to use in God's service. And we only have a certain amount of, of time. Time is short for us here in this world. So Ephesians 5 and verse 16, Paul says, redeeming the time as wise we are to be wise, he says, because the days are evil. So he says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And then he says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So if I know what God wants me to do with my time and my money and my body and my life, then I will be wise and do those things. And that means I have to redeem the time. The word redeem literally means to buy back. And it was the idea of a person who had been sold into slavery and you paid the price to purchase their freedom, to buy them out of bondage. That's what Jesus did at the cross for us. When we talk about redemption and being redeemed by his blood, he paid the price to free us from the bondage of the devil, to give us freedom from sin. Well, here he says redeeming or buying back the time. And that means we have to buy up opportunities to do God's will. That again, that time is passing, and so we have to have our eyes open looking for those opportunities to do good. And when we see them, don't just let it pass by, but seize that opportunity and do what is good. So again, when I'm asking the question, should I do this or not, I need to ask, is this being a good steward of what God has given me? Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If I'm going to put God's kingdom and his righteousness first, his kingdom is the church and his righteousness is the gospel and the righteousness that comes from living according to it, if I'm going to put that first, then I have to be a good steward of what God has given me and use it to do good rather than doing evil. So it's an important question to ask. Does this uh, activity, is it being a good steward of what God has given me, using it for the best, or is it wasting it on things that are not pleasing unto him? Then we go to Romans chapter 14, 
in verse 23. We studied about this not too long ago in our study of the book of Romans. But the question we have to ask is, is this thing offensive to my conscience? Will it offend my conscience? Paul says, he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And we talked about how his statement there, if something is not of faith, means that you believe that this is wrong. So it would, it would affect your conscience. It would go against your conscience. And the Bible teaches us about the conscience that, of course, all people have one. God creates us with one. Uh, we're born with them. But we have the responsibility to train them correctly according to the teaching of scriptures. So you can read 1 Timothy 1 and, and 1 Timothy 3 also, which talk about that idea of the conscience. And then chapter 4, we read about people who violate their conscience. And the thing about the conscience is when you do something that you, you've been taught or you've learned that is wrong, your conscience bothers you and it tells you, I shouldn't have done that, right? But the more you keep doing what is wrong, the duller your conscience becomes and you can get to the point where you completely silence it. And that's a dangerous thing to do. The Bible calls it hardening your heart because we can harden our hearts so much that we, uh, we, we stop listening to God's word and we can be lost because of that. And so we don't want to do anything that violates our conscience. Now Paul is talking about things in Romans 14 that are not necessarily sinful. Some people believe that it was wrong to eat meat offered to idols. They said if they did that, they would be partaking in idol worship and they didn't want to do it. Paul said it's not wrong, it's just meat. There are no idols anyway. They're not real gods. So if somebody offers you that meat, just eat it. But if you believe that it's wrong to do that, Paul says absolutely do not do it. Because if you do that, you'll be violating your conscience. And once we start violating our conscience, we start hardening our hearts. And so if I believe that something is wrong, even if the Bible doesn't say it's wrong, if I believe that it's wrong, then I cannot do that without sinning. So I need, either need to retrain my conscience according to Scripture or not do that which I believe is wrong. But that's the principle that we're not to live in such a way that violates our conscience. And then lastly, and this is in a lot of ways the most important question to ask uh, of all of these things. When I'm making a decision whether or not to do something, the question I need to ask is, will I be following the example of Jesus if... I do this. Over in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 40, we've talked about before what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We even mentioned it at the beginning of this lesson that we are to learn and we are to follow and we are to imitate. Luke 6 40, Jesus says, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And that's the goal of discipleship to be like the master, to be like Jesus. And so it's a valid question, and it's an important question. If I do this, am I following the example of Jesus? Or, put very simply, would Jesus do this? There was that saying, you know, that became so popular several years ago, what would Jesus do? And people, you know, wore the T-shirts and the bracelets and all those things. And it kind of became just this thing that, that people said and lost some of its power, but not only is it valid, but it is powerful and it's important. What would Jesus do in this situation? People kind of laugh at that idea now, but it's exactly what the Bible tells us we're supposed to ask. If I think that Jesus probably would not do this, then I shouldn't do it either. That's probably a good indication that it's wrong and that it's sinful. If Jesus wouldn't be a part of this, then I shouldn't be a part of it. If Jesus wouldn't say that word, then I shouldn't say it. If Jesus wouldn't tell that joke, then I shouldn't tell it. If Jesus wouldn't go to that place or to that event, then I shouldn't go. Right? That's the principle because we're trying to be like him. He's our shepherd. We're trying to follow him and not just follow him but walk as closely as we can to him. And so we need to think about what would he do. So we read our Bibles and we read about Jesus' life. We look at his example 
we study the way that he lived and the way that he thought and the way that he acted toward others, toward sin and sinful situations, toward temptation, and we try to pattern our lives after him. Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which means think the way that Jesus thought. And again, that's what we're trying to do as Christians, to learn to think like Jesus thought, to have the same attitude that he had, the same reasoning that he had, to, to be thinking in the same way that Jesus thought, to see the world the way that he did. And so we can discern between good and evil when we think about things the way that Jesus did. And again, if the Bible says that it's wrong, that's coming from Jesus. This is his word. It's his gospel. And so if I want to be like him, I have to listen to what he says, look to his example, and ask, would Jesus do this? Now, when we start to apply these things in our lives, it becomes clear very quickly the difference and the distinction between good and evil. And sometimes we don't like to think this way because it starts eliminating things from our lives that are enjoyable or pleasurable or things that we want to do and want to be a part of. But the goal is to be like Christ, to walk closely to him. And if that's what I'm trying to do in my life, then I have to be willing to remove those things that are not like Jesus, that don't follow his example, and that are not in harmony with his will. That means I have to be willing to repent. Repentance at its heart, and at its most basic, the word repent means to change the mind. And what it means is that I don't see sin the way that I want to see it, like this is fun and this is something that I want to do, but I see it the way that Jesus sees it. And Jesus says it may be fun for a little while, but it condemns your soul to eternal punishment and it's not worth it and so to see sin as it is I have to think like Jesus thought and that's what repentance is all about changing my mind towards sin to seeing it the way that the Lord sees it and then it will result in a change in the way that I live if I see the sinful things in this world as the things that that drove the nails into the hands of the Savior on the cross the things that caused those lashes upon his back and the crown of thorns on his head, then I can't love those things anymore. I have to hate them to the point that I'll turn away from them, which is what repentance brings about, a reformation in life. I turn away from sin and turn toward the Lord. And as I do that, I'm listening to what God's word says. I have faith in Christ, which has led me to repent. So then I become willing to confess my faith in Jesus, and as he commands me to do, I'll be baptized for the remission of my sins, committing my life to him to live in harmony with his will, walking closer to him every day. That's God's plan of salvation. It's the way our sins are forgiven and the way we become Christians. Faith, repentance, confession of faith, and baptism for the remission of sins. If someone here today needs to do that, everything is ready and prepared, and we can help you. If you want to be closer to Jesus by becoming one of his disciples, those are the steps to take. If you've done those things, however, and haven't been seeing things the way that the Lord does, haven't been facing sin the way that the Lord faced it, and haven't resisted it, haven't overcome your temptations, but have given in, and there's sin that needs to be forgiven, you can be forgiven. Again, by repenting, changing your heart toward those things, turning back to the Lord, confessing that you've done wrong and asking the Lord for forgiveness through prayer. He promises to hear and to answer. We'll pray with you and for you, and we know that God is true to his word. So we encourage you that if you have sin that needs to be forgiven, discern between right and wrong. Where you see the wrong, turn away from it, make it right, and then make right choices. Do that which is good, and we'll be on our way to that eternal home in heaven. If anyone here today has a need to make sin right in a public way, we'll help you with that. The opportunity is yours if you'll come forward as we stand and as we sing.